Did you, do you have the one? Yeah, no, okay, good, fine. Awesome. I think we're all set. I'm gonna sit here just in case that doesn't do it. Welcome everybody to another Hub Talk. We have um, Dr. Kim Naiman here. Many of you, like myself, know her well from our four-legged that live with us. Um, she's been practicing here in Norfolk for 19 years mm -hmm. and been in practice for 32. So um, she's going to tell us all about some things at home we can be prepared for to best help our pets when they need us probably the most. So um, with that, I'm just going to keep it simple and turn it right over. Okay. To all right. Um, yes, um, she said, Kim Maynard, um, I have a practice here that is now known as Berkshire Animal Care. We recently changed our name um, on 44. And um, when I... First, okay to, to do this, I was thinking, actually, I probably wasn't thinking about exactly what I was going to do. But when I started putting it together, I got thinking since, since um, COVID and all of that, the veterinary profession in general is very short staffed. And we're short staffed doctors, we're short staffed um, technicians with support. So I am doing more recommendations online, looking at pictures, watching videos. Um, giving triaging over the phone, giving advice over the phone way more than we used to, just because we don't have the slots in our schedule to get so many things in. Every ear infection I used to treat, you know, had to come in. Every eye issue had to come in. You know, every rash had to come in. Nowadays, we just can't do that. So we're trying to look at pictures, look at videos, um, and see if it's something that warrants coming in. So I think this lecture is going to be geared more in that direction. So there is first aid here, but it's not like you guys are going to be splinting bones or anything like that. It's more of figuring out, is this something I can handle at home? Is this something I need to come in right away? Is this something I should run by my doctor? But if it's, you know, Sunday afternoon, can I wait till Monday morning? That sort of thing. So I'm hoping I answer those questions for you guys and that we can keep this um, very casual. If you have questions during it, please go ahead and ask. I'm kind of treating this as if we were in the exam room and you guys, I was talking to you about your pet. Okay. So this is a little uh, review. I'm a big fan of Gary Larson cartoons. <laughs> Um, and when Jen texted me about a week ago saying, you know, when you're ready to send me your PowerPoint, I'm like, what? I, I haven't done a PowerPoint in 25 years and I only did one. So, um, so hopefully I did okay here with this, but we're going to, so we're going to cover like symptoms of concern, things that, you know, you guys should be paying attention to, um, how to do a home exam, some of our common medical problems, some of the more critical medical problems, and then the items to have in the first aid kit. And I created a handout with just some dosages um, and a little recipe for the skunk shampoos. And the biggest, most important thing on there is the pet poison hotline. Um, we use that a lot. They've got a um, great um, resource that if you say my animal ate this plant, they will know within a matter of minutes what needs to be done and how to plan to together for me. You called me and said my plan ate, my animal ate this plan. I'm going to be running through, pulling out books, pulling out resources, looking up online, things like that. So we actually use them a lot now. Um, they can just give us the whole plan really quick, and we all know what to do. Um, and they can even tell you over the phone, no, this is something that you don't need to go in for. You'll be fine. They um, they do charge and they probably they don't give you any information until they do get your credit card number, but I think it's around $85. So, all right. So symptoms of concern. So these are the big things. Um, the vomiting and diarrhea, we get those every single day. And the first thing I try and treat my staff to ask the clients and I ask the clients is, what are we vomiting? Did we vomit just once yesterday and once today? Did we vomit eight times overnight? Are we vomiting up nonstop? Is there blood in it? Um, are they still happy and eating? 
by vomiting once or twice a day. There's a huge difference in those two things. And there's a different plan in those two things. Happy and, and oh, I need to step back. Majority, nobody's disappointed. Majority of this talk is gonna be about those. Cats don't seem to get in as much trouble. We'll go over a few of those things. I mean, cats do vomit, they get diarrhea, but a lot of these things are very dog focused. Um, but again, cats too. If the vomiting is causing them to get depressed, if they aren't eating, um, if they're lethargic, if they're hiding, you got to put the whole package together. That's worthy of calling your bed. Um, but if they eat their breakfast, throw it up, and then go about their day and eat lunch and eat dinner, and then maybe do it again one more day, is give it a little more time. They may be just overeating. They may have an upset stomach. They may not agree with the food you're giving them. Might just need to back off a little bit, give them a little more time. But again, frequent vomiting bothers me the most because they lose a lot of electrolytes. They lose a lot of hydration that way. And there's nothing you can do if they're throwing up the medicine you're giving them. So usually we need to see them. We need to stop that vomiting. Same with diarrhea, little loose stool, little diarrhea. They have it once or twice, but they're doing well. They're still eating their meals. They're happy running around. We usually tell you to do a bland diet. And bland diet is usually like some ground chicken and ground turkey mixed with some white rice or brown rice. Uh, we don't want seasoning. We don't want fat. We don't want bones. We want it small meals um, of bland food over two to three days. And usually that will get most diarrhea straightened back out again. And then you start mixing in your dog food or cat food back in. Now cats with bland diet is a little harder to do. You could get just cooked chicken, like rotisserie meat, um, and just feed them that. You can do baby food, uh, chicken baby food, turkey baby food, but here's a huge thing, and I should have put it up there. No onions, no onion salts. Cats cannot have onions or onion salts, and a lot of baby foods will put that in there. So if you're gonna do bland food for your kitties, just make sure that's not in the jar. The ingredients will be on the back. But to be safe, you can just use some deli meat, small meals, again, with vomiting, you don't want to stretch the stomach. So you're given little tiny meals, giving that stomach a chance to relax. And we, we forget to mention water a lot, but dogs that are vomiting will want to drink a lot of water and you got to take it away from them because every time they drink a lot of water, they stretch their stomach and it all comes back out again. So you got to treat the water just like the food, little amounts until it looks like it's under control. But with either of these, if they're lethargic and they're not eating, that's a reason to call your bed. Um, coughing, again, a little bit of coughing, we all do it, not a big deal. But if they're like really, really like sound like they got the croup or um, it's escalating or yesterday it was a couple coughs, today it's a little more, next day you're hearing it all day long, that's something that needs to intervene. Um, we got a dosage for Robitussin DM. We use that a lot for kettle cough. Um, it doesn't treat kettle cough, but it helps quiet things down as we're treating the kettle cough. So that can help um, with dogs. And we emphasize Robitussin DM. There's a whole bunch of Robitussins. And again, that is specifically for dogs. Lameness, we get a lot of lameness, um, limping, you know, use it again in perspective. Are they off food? Are they limping on more than one leg? We start to think Lyme disease. That's something to let us know about. But if they're playing hard in the yard and they come in a little bit lame, rest them. Um, I got a buffer and dose on there for the dogs. You can give them um, a little bit of that, give them a rest, see if it continues for several days. If it does, then it's something to let us see. But um, if they're acting fine and don't seem to care and they warm out of it, just reduce their exercise for a while, have them rest it, and try the bufferin, um, preferably buffered aspirin. Got to give it with food. It can be really hard on their stomach, so make sure you give it with a meal. Um, let's see. Increased respiratory effort. That is a big warning sign. If your pet is breathing hard, and I'm not talking panting. Panting is a cooling mechanism. Um, it's not really breathing most of the time for the dogs. We're talking about like if you were just to do a 100 meter sprint 
if their belly is going up and down, up and down, and the chest is moving up and down for no reason. They weren't playing in the yard. They're just laying there. That's a warning. Something's going on, and, and we should see them for that. Um, lack of interest in food. You know, you have one one morning they're off food, but then they're eating fine later. I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but again, look at it in perspective with everything else here. If you've got vomiting and diarrhea and no interest in food, then we're more interested in that. You can try bland small meals, bland diets, see if that sparks their interest. Um, but if you go 24 hours not eating, that's worthwhile to call us over. Trouble walking is different than the layman's. Trouble walking, I made that a broad term, but um, if they're acting kind of drunk, if they're staggering, if their back legs are swaying or they're crossing over, when we usually start thinking either something neurological or they can be just a generalized weakness, which can be anemia, um, internal bleeding. Those are more serious things. Is so, and if it just was for a minute and then they were fine, uh, then maybe a leg was asleep when they got up. <laughs> but if they're doing it nonstop and can't seem to come out of it, they're listing to one side, that's um, serious. Or they can't even get up. That's definitely a call to your vet. Um, lethargy, and there's a huge spectrum to that. But if you've got an old dog or an old cat, that's their, their mode of operation. <laughs> But if um, they're normally a really active animal and they are suddenly very lethargic and it's lasting throughout the entire day, that's, a, that's an important reason to call. And we're going to go over the a physical exam. Some of these things, you know, you guys can look at home to learn a little bit more. Uh, painful. Now, I want to go back and mention lameness. I have so many clients that um, I might use the word, you know, um, pain when they bring them in for lameness and they go, no, no, it's not in pain. I need to emphasize if they're limping, they're in pain. Um, they're, it may not be excruciating crying out pain, but it's the same thing with us. We don't bear full weight on the leg. It's because that leg's hurting us and we're trying not to. So that is still pain, but the crying out, sudden crying out pain, um, that's more serious. Usually we're thinking a pinched nerve, um, a disc. So if you have a disc, and we're having trouble walking and we're dragging a leg, you know, put the package together. That's important. That needs to be seen. And then the runny eyes, runny nose. Um, I'll go over some uh, ideas on how to evaluate that and then um, uh, some ways to know whether it's serious or not. All right, anyone have any questions about this screen? Okay, so here we go with the home exam. So mentation and behavior, you know, that's talking about are they are they suddenly mentally dull? Are they not responding to you? They're not um, kind of wandering off looking at the ground. Um, you know, that that's where we're going with, with the, the personality. I guess it'd be a better way. If you know your dog's personality or your cat's personality, and it's suddenly different. And you know. We get dogs that will stare at the wall, walk over and just get stuck in a corner, go outside, can't seem to find their way back to the front door because they something's going on up here. Um, so that's one thing we like you to observe. The color of the gums. If I got some of these, there we go. Color of the gums. Um, and the big thing I need to mention here too is know your pet because until you know what's normal, you're not going to know what's abnormal for your pet. But this one up here, gum should be pretty much bubblegum pink. And that black area you see above the big tooth, that's normal. That's just pigmentation. This guy down here, I don't even know, could be alive. That is so white. That is very anemic. Usually that's anemia or a really serious circulation issue like shock. Um, you can also get yellow gums like Ictrus. Um, you can get a deep, deep, beet red gums. Those guys are usually got a fever. They're um, something is septic. They're sick inside. So the other thing to do is you'll see me do it in the room a lot is we'll push on the gum and we call it like we blanch it out. So we'll push on it and let go. It'll be white when we first let go. We count, you know, one potato, two potato until it gets pink again. And 
we want that to be roughly one to two seconds. If it takes three to four seconds, that's our old school way of checking blood pressure. Um, and that's what we used for a very long time until we had blood pressure machines. So if you push on it, let go, and I'll do it a couple different spots um, and see how long does it take for the pink to come back in. And that can tell you about circulation. So if you have an animal that seems depressed, not much energy, the gums aren't quite as bubbled on pink as they used to be, or we call it capillary refill time isn't under two seconds, then that's a worry, something's going on. Um, the eyes, that's a normal eye up top. We want the sclera, the white part to be nice and white. Mm -hmm. We want the cornea to be shiny. Um, we want the pupils to be the same size, both eyes. Um, this guy down here, he's got a little bit of a bacterial conjunctivitis. You can see the corner of the eye, that third eyelid is red. And there's a bit of a green mucousy discharge there. Um, and that I usually tell clients initially if you got saline solution for contact, rinse that out a couple times a day. If it keeps coming back, then we need to put them on an antibiotic. But sometimes that's just due to dust and debris and hair. Just think they can't wash that stuff out of their eyes. So once it gets stuck in there, it does cause inflammation. So if you can just use like what you use for contacts, but not the cleaners, just the saline, you can get that at the grocery store, um, rinse it out for a few days. Um, if it keeps coming back, let us know. Or if they seem exceptionally uncomfortable and they're rubbing like crazy, they're gonna scratch their eye. So you need we need to intervene. Could you use sodium chloride drops? Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and when first comes to shove, you can just use regular water. You just want to be really, really gentle about it and and spread it. Still no yeah. different than us doing this in the same. Okay, and then um, let me go back here. Eyes, ears, nose. Um, so that was the eyes, and the other things. The cornea, like I mentioned over here, it's nice and clear and shiny. You can see the light reflecting. If it looks dull or hazy or has a white covering to it, that's not normal, and um, that could be that there's some sort of trauma has occurred to the actual cornea. They may have rubbed it, scraped it. And that's worth um, having a see. But like I said, initially try try rinsing it. And it, you know, even if it's mucusy, not necessarily green or yellow, still rinse it out. See if they recover from that alone. Um, well, these are the common problems. We'll go back over. Okay, so doing the physical, the ears again. Get to know your dog's ears. I'm a big smeller. I think. Smell is, is just important as in seeing and touching and listening to my patients. And I would smell ears frequently. And I even had a teenage girl point it out to her mom. She goes, see, I told her she smells the ears. <laughs> because that smell, that, that yeasty, musty smell is very distinct. And you can tell if there's an ear infection. And a lot of clients will clean ears and they'll take care of them real well. But... Ear canal is very long. It goes down and then does almost like a 90 degree turn. And most clients are cleaning up here and you can't see what's going on around the corner. So relying on the odor to get you an idea of something's going on in there. Um, the head shaking, scratching, redness, those are all signs. Um, as far as home care goes for ears, uh, I'll uh, move forward to, right? uh, I'll, I'll bring up the ears here in a bit. Home care, you can get cleaners over the counter at the grocery store or pet stores, and they're good at getting basic infections under control, just mild ones. They'll flush out the wax. They dry out the moisture. They're good for dogs that swim a lot, about once or twice a week, cleaning them out. It'll help dry out the moisture down in the ears. As far as home care goes, I do have some clients that have done a whole of apple cider uh, use. And I'll show you some ear you don't want to use that in, but a little apple cider diluted in water, cleaning out the ears, it's good for killing yeast. So sometimes that's a home care option. But other things, if you ever get medicine from your doctor for an ear infection and you use it and you have some left over, keep it. A lot of these things I say keep in a box. Um, it's good to pull out and use if you think you need it. Heartbeat, I'm going to show you on this guy. If you want to be feeling um, the heartbeat, 
it is right behind their elbows. These are their elbows and it's right behind there. So it, feeling that um, and feeling if it's really rapid or really slow. And again, get to know your pet ahead of time. We usually want the heartbeat to be between 80 and 120 beats per minute. And we want it to be regular. So if you're feeling that, and of course you're gonna be doing this because something doesn't seem right with your pet. If it's like ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum, that's not normal. It should be regular. Um, so that can be something to bring to our attention. How many for a cat? Cats. Um, so cats in an animal hospital are usually around at one eighty to two hundred beats per minute. Okay. Um, at <laughs> small. Yeah, and they're nervous. Um, at home, I would think he should be more like around 120, 150. Okay. It's very hard to count the rate in a cat. I usually tell people count it for six seconds only and then multiply by 10 because it's so fast, it's hard to count that fast for a long time. Um, so just because we're figuring it out for a minute. So for six seconds, multiply by 10, I don't know what the minute rate is. Yeah. Um, oh, I want the nose, um, nasal discharge. You, we get watery, we get mucus, we get pus, we get blood. Um, a little watery discharge, usually don't worry. Mucus are starting to get a little bit more concerned. Blood's a big concern, want to know about that. If you get a bloody nose and a dog, some of the questions we're going to ask are, have you seen blood anywhere else? The blood in the poop, blood in the urine, bruises. Um, we're looking for a clotting issue uh, or history of trauma. Did they get hit in the face? Could that be um, what's going on? Breathing, we talked about a little bit before. We're looking for where there's an effort. There's a chest that's moving. Uh, back to nose, excessive dryness in the, you know, in the actual, in the it's, it's usually an observation, not a medical concern. Mm -hmm. um, Vaseline, um, any sort of oil, more of an oil base um, is good to put on there. Um, bad bomb is not bad, but lotions and they lick it. So anything water soluble, they're gonna lick and it's gonna come off. And we see it more in the winter, but no, it's not a hint towards a big problem. Um, so the breathing, the chest moving a lot, the belly moving a lot, um, that's a concern. Uh, and then the walking, I kind of just threw that in there to cover the lim limping, ataxia, that's the kind of the drunken swaying or dragging a leg or can't even get up. Um, those are things to know your dog's gait. You know, you if you got a 13 year old dog, he's probably not moving like a two year old dog. So know what his normal level of mobility is so that it can be worse one day, then we're gonna wanna know about that. And then skin, we're talking about rashes. Um, that's usually the biggest thing. Bumps, thrusts, redness. Oh, I, I should have put pictures up here of it. Um, come May through August, the um, black flies. We see a lot of black fly bites that people, um, it's like an emergency. Uh, they bring them in and I feel so bad charging them for an exam because as soon as I look, I'm like, no, that's a black fly bite. It's, it is a target. It's a red circle with a red dot in the middle. That is not tick bite. It's not Lyme disease. Those are the black flies. A lot of dogs get allergic reactions to them. And I'll show you a picture with the hives. Um, and then the deer flies, same thing. They, they get a lot of those red bumps. Cortisone cream, usually good for that, or even Benadryl cream is good for those. All right, so we saw the eyes. All right, so these are some of the common things we see and that you might be able to handle at home. We get a lot of broken nails. Um, this is the way I usually treat it, is I, and I describe it to clients, is if you slam your finger in a door or you hit it with a hammer, you keep trimming it along until you get that abnormal part of the nail off and um, watch out for infections and um, treat it with pain meds and, and try and take care of it. I don't do anything super fancy when clients bring these. I don't sedate them and, and cut way back. Um, this guy, I would probably trim this section that's loose. I'm trying to get rid of the jagged, what's gonna be hurting them. Um, 
it will be open now. So you're going to want to have something like cornstarch or styptic if it tries to bleed. That's what we use for um, nails when we trim a nail too short. And then the next thing is after you get the jagged section off and that one over there, that one's already hanging off. You would just take your clippers and just cut here and finish and get it off. You can use hydrogen peroxide to clean up the foot. You might get a little resistance from the dog about it, but it's still something to use. But my favorite, I think um, I put it on one of the lists is chlorhexidine solution or a betadine solution you get in the drugstore. If it's not already diluted, I highly recommend diluting it. It can be irritating it. I, during COVID, when we really weren't seeing a lot of patients, um, I dispensed so much chlorhexidine solution because everybody was out hiking with their dogs and everybody was getting broken toenails and we were seeing these nonstop. So this one, this is a little information here. This looks a little older. This is red and puffy right here. Um, either it's starting to get a little bit of a nail base infection or this dog has lifted so much it's making it swell. So those are just things to observe that that's getting a little out of control. That definitely needs some antiseptic. We need to get the dog to leave it alone. We may give it pain medicine, so like a bufferin. We have different things at the clinic that are a little more safe, but back in the day, we didn't have them and we used bufferin a lot. So a lot of dogs will do okay on just a day or two of bufferin. Any questions about broken nails? Uh, whoever's helping you, have them hold tight to the dog when you're trimming this. We usually do like a one, two, three clip. Oh, I brought this. Some of the things we use for helping, um, we will put a towel or a blanket over the head. It quiets them down a little bit and it also keeps their teeth from finding our hands. <laughs> so that's another way to help. And then in a worst case scenario, this is if your dog's ever in pain and a cat towels work really good too. put a big thick towel or small blanket over them and um, make sure the head is covered. But dogs, you can make a homemade um, muzzle is just use your leash and then come around here a couple times and back around. So if your dog gets hurt and it's too painful, it's not letting you pick it up. You can do something like that until you can get it into the car and get it to your bed. All right, here's some skin issues. Um, these are called hot spots. Again, the black flies and deer flies can get dogs going. Tick bites can get dogs going doing this. They do this to them themselves and they can do this in a matter of hours. Um, it's pretty fast. Um, moisture, the, we see a lot of these during the really hot, humid months of the year. Uh, dogs that swim a lot, maybe even a dog that just got bathed and didn't get a real good dry out and has a thick, heavy coat. And um, they will go to town. And then in the heat of the summer, flies love to lay maggots in these things. So that's one of the big reasons we like to shave. We want to get it aired out. So if you have the ability to shave any hair off your pet, if they have a hot spot, um, I recommend it. It's usually kind of tender. So just do what you can do. Um, we try and clean it again with the chlorhexidine is what we would use and you guys can use it. And then if you get a cortisone spray, um, you can put that on there two or three days aggressively. Sometimes if you catch these early enough at home, you can stop them in their tracks. If they get real bad, then we usually put them on antibiotics and uh, oral steroids or injectable steroids. But um, that's, that's what hot spots look like. Any questions there? Okay. And this is this makes our day fun when we get these at the clinic. Um, we do have to make time for them, but we all enjoy doing these at the clinic. So these, um, a lot of you may have tried these already. This one, if you got a good dog, this might be one worthwhile trying at home. Um, if you don't have hemostats. Uh, needle nose pliers are good. You want to get as close to the dog as possible when you're pulling these out. You don't want to be grabbing way out at the end. You want to get close, pull them in the direction that they went in at. Some will break. For some reason, the tissues of the dogs right under their nose and right under their lips, the quills just love to stay there. And um, a lot of them will break off while we're trying to pull them out. 
these are all mature porcupine quills. These are a lot easier to get out than the little the little porcupines with the little quills. Those are hard to get out. Um, again, you may want to give this guy some buffering um, for that day. This guy, don't even bother. Don't start. Don't waste your time. Anything like this. I love the clients. They'll wrestle their dog for three hours one night and get out 80% of the quills and then bring them to me the next day. And I'm like, I'm anesthetizing them and to get those last 20%. So they tried, they're hoping they could get them all out, but you know, we usually put them under anesthesia. That guy over there would take probably three people, two hours to that dog there. So, um, but yeah, you, you can, and if these break, if you can still see the end, keep trying to pull it, but if not, watch that area, clean it, with the chlorhexidine, betadine, um, maybe antibiotic ointment. If it starts to fester and blister, um, getting little micro abscesses, then give us a call. I've had a lot of quills just go way under the skin and we can't get them out. And we just leave them and wait to see if they're gonna be an issue. And surprisingly, a lot aren't. But every once in a while, one will turn into a big mess. But um, they, you know, you don't always have to get them all out. If you're going to attempt these, but you see, if you're looking in, and you see them up in the air, up up their tongue, through for their mouth, don't bother. I don't think you're going to get those out. You might as well bring them in. I've had huskies, certain breeds we see a lot of, the, the, the quills, I've had to go all the way back to the back of the throat. They, they've gotten them way in there. I don't know if that porcupine lived after that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that comes springtime, we'll get a lot of those. All right, now lacerations. Some of these are things you can handle at home. Some of these should be brought in. The sooner we see them, the better we can do a good job on healing and, and getting them back together again. Uh, the one on the far, um, you're right over here, that's more of a puncture. You can see the finger next to it. That is something that if you clip the fur, clean it with chlorhexidine and put neosporin or bacitracin on it, you'll probably be fine. Um, it, this foot pad, foot pads are really hard to sew back together. They just don't want to, the stitches tear through them. I keep just cleaning them. Um, same thing, chlorhexidine, antibiotic ointment, a couple times a day and try and let them right out. If it looks really, really deep, We'll probably want to bandage it up and provide some support and keep it clean. But otherwise, you might try and take care of that at home. Or, you know, like I said, if this is like a Friday night and you don't want to go to the emergency clinic, that's definitely something you could at least take care of for a few days until Monday morning you can get into your bed. Now, this one, I think I'm looking at the hiney here, and and I, I'm thinking these lacerations are maybe about three to four inches long. These have already started to, this is a little old, and it's starting to seal to the um, tissue that's underneath. That's better off getting to us sooner than later, because otherwise now we have to go in and cut away all that tissue that's starting to seal, get back the pressure tissue to close it. We can still do it, but um, we can do a better job if we get to it a little earlier. So that would be one I wouldn't try and do at home. You can still clean it until you get to us. But again, sooner we can do a better job. Right. Okay. I told Jen, I said, I couldn't put a photograph of this up. I had to do something cartoon. I just didn't want to see it. Um, I think we covered a bit of this in the initial part, but um, vomiting and diarrhea, think about what caused it. Um, if you never give your dog a big ear, and yesterday you gave him a big ear, that's probably why he has diarrhea today. You can try the bland diet, the chicken and rice or hamburger and rice. Um, vomiting, again, you gotta back off. You gotta give the stomach a little time to rest. Give them roughly six hours of no food and try a little meal. If during that six hours they're vomit, 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 then you probably should get to the vet. But otherwise, give them, give their tummy a little rest. See if you can get um, a little bland food. See if it stays down, and slowly, patiently work them back up. 
Um, again, how long has it been going on? If somebody calls me with one vomit that day, I'm not going to get too worried. I'll get people who call me and been vomiting for six days. So like you should have been in like four days ago. So um, that worries us. Um, if we see blood, blood in the vomit bothers us more. Blood in the poop, that tells us more than likely we're dealing with the back end of the intestinal tract. It does not mean that there's a foreign object in it that's sharp that's cutting them. It just means that the colon's angry, it's inflamed, and it's oozing some blood, and it needs a little intervention to quiet it down. Um, and again, are they energetic and eating, or are they depressed and off food? Depressed and off food dogs should go to the vet. Cats too. I'm sorry. Cats too. Um, and like I said, I worry more about vomiting. We seem to get more dehydration with vomiting, more electrolyte disturbances with vomiting than we do with diarrhea. Um, the lameness, talked again about what caused it. Um, if you're playing with Frisbee and they went up and came down and lame, that, then we have a good idea. If you come home from work and they're lame, we don't really know. Are they acting sick? You know, dogs with Lyme usually act sick. They go off food. Usually more than one leg is hurting, so you won't actually get that. You'll get a dog that's like, we call it walking on eggshells. It's like everything hurts and they just can't walk normally. Um, that's, you know, a reason to, to bring them on in. But if, if we got one limp, you know, go to bed, see how they are in the morning. You know, if you got the buffer and aspirin, um, give it a try and see how they are the next day. If you have any leftover of any other pain management, like a lot of you might know, like Harpoquin, Rimadil, Meloxicam, we dispense it a lot for like post-op. That's, that's even a better option than buffered aspirin. And you can give them one dose, see how they do. Um, do they have something to prevent Lyme disease in dogs? There's a vaccine for Lyme disease. There's, oh, okay. Yeah, and there is um, a lot of good tick products out now that can help try and keep the ticks off of them. Okay, and cats too? Or? Yes, there's no vaccine for kitties. And actually, to be honest with you, they've never been able to find Lyme disease in cats in nature. As far as I know, they can create it in the lab, but for some reason in the natural setting, they don't get one. But we should be most concerned about our dogs. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, look for any wounds, um, you know, that can help. Look at the foot, look between the toes. This is, I love, dog, most of you dog owners know your dogs hate their nails to be trimmed and they don't like their feet to be touched. And every limping dog that comes in, the owner condenses in the foot. And I'm like, all right, well, we'll look at the foot. And just because the dog's doing this doesn't mean the problem's in the foot. Touch the other foot, see if you get the same reaction. Um, but look for asymmetry between, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. I still will look because I've got everything from Chihuahuas, the Mastiffs. So you look for a difference between the two legs. Is there any symmetry? Does the wrist look bigger than this wrist? Um, does it look more swollen here than over here? Or does one toe look bigger than the other three toes beside it? And unfortunately the test for discomfort, if I elicit pain in one spot, I'll go around and I'll come back to it again and see if I can get the same reaction in the same spot. Because sometimes they're just scared and they don't want to be examined and they get upset. They have to prove it to me that that's where it hurts. Um, look at the nails, um, look for cuts. Most of the time, or these are the most common scenarios. Broken bones are the least common. Unless your dog got hit by a car or fell from a pretty high area or is a very petite boned dog, um, those little min pins that have bones that are like little sticks, they can break their legs just jumping off the table. But it usually takes a fair level of trauma to break a bone. So look for another thing and really pulled muscles, neck pain, uh, ligament strains, cruciate strains. Those are our most common issues. Giving them a few days of uh, rest, see how they do before you need to call us. And again, I'm not trying to discourage you from calling us, but this is home first aid. So we're seeing if there's some things that might work at home. It never hurts to call to just get advice though. Um, but again, if this is a Saturday or Sunday, all right, so here's our ears. Um, the cleaners that I mentioned, sometimes they'll be good enough to get, see all that dark brown wax that you see right here? You wanna put it in, and I 
for these things. And a lot of people will wet down a cotton ball and clean the top. We want this to go down in and make that turn and get around and loosen everything up. And then you swash under the ear. I think of it as like when you're trying to get the toilet unplugged, <laughs> is that you're trying to make the solution go up and down and up and down and up and down and soften everything up, let them shake it out. But don't ever go in with Q-tips. Um, go in with a cotton ball on your finger. We'll never get to the eardrum. Q-tip could. And we don't want to hit the eardrum. And just clean what you can at the surface and then give it another round. Let them slosh and, and loosen it up. If you do that, and then two days later, it looks exactly the same, then you got a pretty good infection and you're gonna need some medicine. But um, if it looks pretty good after that, then you're probably okay. That over there is basically a hot spot on the ear. Um, that's very angry, very inflamed, and don't put a cleaner in that ear. Um, it doesn't need cleaning. It needs inflammation under control, it hurts. So that's one maybe worthwhile getting a buffer in until you can get them to the vet. Um, we might put them on steroids. And then once all the swelling and inflammation is down, then we'll work on the ear infection. But um, that will burn like crazy if you put apple cider vinegar or any sort of alcohol-based cleaner in there and you're just gonna make them worse. Um, I think we did eyes. We talked about the eyes a bit there. Um, there's our hives. These are allergy reactions. We see a lot of these with the black flies. Um, these bumps here, you can see all over. Those are hives. They can get them all over their body, on their belly. Easy places to look is the belly because there's not much hair there. You can get appreciation for what their skin is. But sometimes she's kind of getting the light just right and looking at them from across. Uh, you'll see those. This is when you get the angioedema in the face and they get real puffy. See this after some vaccine reactions. See it with a lot of bee stings, fly bites. And um, that's where the Benadryl comes in. So you have on your sheet the Benadryl tablets. Um, it's a milligram per pound, and you can always err on the high side. Benadryl is really safe. And it comes in a 25 milligram tablet. So if you got a 20 pound dog, you can give them a 25 milligram. Um, if there's vomiting and diarrhea associated with this, which is pretty uncommon, that's that's the next step of an allergic reaction, and that's worthwhile calling the emergency clinic or you know your vet. But otherwise, if you get these, and usually they're pretty itchy, they might be itchy all over or itchy really on their face. Just don't let them tear themselves up, but um, get the Benadryl in them, and you can even do it like three times in a day, and hopefully by the next day everything will be quieted back down again. All right, so these are more of our critical um, problems. Again, a lot of um, marijuana and marijuana product toxicity these days, a, a ton of it. Um, these guys come in heavily sedated, um, very dry mouths. They can, it can be very toxic depending on how much they get into. Uh, we do a lot of supportive care, get it IV fluids, get it out of their system, treat any secondary side effects. I've been talking about buffered aspirin a lot, but I want to emphasize buffered aspirin is not the same as anything else. So do not use anything else. One tablet of Tylenol will kill a cat. Um, and if you give enough Tylenol to a dog, the margin of safety there is pretty tight. Um, I wouldn't encourage anyone to even give that. Okay, so Aleve, even ibuprofen, I would stay away from just good old fashioned aspirin is, is what we use in a pinch when we need something at home. Um, the, the rat poisoning, we still see a lot of that. That is very deadly. If you suspect your dog got into it, um, you need to treat. And it's not, it's not a tough treatment, it's vitamin K. We just put them on vitamin K. But we need to know what they got into. If they ever get into anything, have that product with you when you call poison control, when you talk to your vet, because there's different types of rat poisoning, gets treated a little bit different. But most of these guys, we get them on vitamin K. But we have to treat them from exposure. If we wait till symptoms are occurring, which is hemorrhaging, you can't save them. And it's it's a bad way to go. So um 
take it seriously. Even if you're like, oh, I don't know if he ate it, it doesn't hurt to take four weeks of vitamin K. Um, it's not like an expensive hospitalization or anything like that. Um, this didn't have a sign on it. Do not use in cats. That's mainly talking about if you have any sort of parasite product, like you're using on your dog a tick or flea product, or you're spraying around the house for ticks or any products, do not use it on your cat, especially the dog product. If it says for dogs only, a lot of permethrin products um, are out there and they will make cats very ill, even kill them. Um, it causes seizures, um, muscle, like uncontrolled muscle contractions, and it can be pretty bad to them. I had, you know, old school people think, well, if it kills fleas in the house, it'll kill the fleas on the cat, but it'll also kill the cat. So don't, I, I, I went to school in Florida. We saw a lot of crazy things down there with people, products that people just felt was okay to use on cats. Excuse me. So the pesticides, um, that they put around the houses and things, would that hurt the animals too? I would talk to the person that puts them on and ask what they are. I can't speak for them. Because I would think that if it affects the dogs or the cats, it would also affect the wild ones too. Yeah, you would have to speak with them about how, what it is, what it is, how long it's, you know, even some of the products that were for dogs only that we were using a lot, Avantix was one, worked really, really well, it was a spot on, but it would kill a cat. So when we were using it, we're telling the clients apply it and for 20, at least 24 hours or at least overnight, keep the dog separate from the cat, especially if they like each other and snuggle their groom. Um, the company said that once it dries, it's okay. So I think that's why they, a lot of those products, they say once the yard dries and there's six hours or 12 hours, you have to stay off of it, then you're okay. I'm sure there's still some out there, but I'm sure there's a, a period that it's much worse. So, so cats are not little dogs. Don't don't feel that if you use half the product, you're safe. They just do not break down permethrins properly. Um, a few other poisonings. I mean, we have chocolate poisoning. We have the grapes and raisins. It's a very bizarre poisoning. We don't understand. We call it idiosyncratic, which means. It can be fine for nine dogs, but then one dog can go into kidney failure from it. We don't understand why. Um, so it's always best to not give them those things. Chocolate is varying levels of toxicity depending on the product. Milk chocolate is not as toxic as dark chocolate, which is not as toxic as baker's chocolate. The stronger the chocolate, the more the phenothiamine, <laughs> which is poisoning. Um, the bigger the dog, the more they can handle it. And that's why I said poison control is great because if you tell them how much you think they ate, tell them how big your dog is, they can tell you not whether you need to do something about it. Um, let's see. And onions, I mentioned the onions and onion salt, especially with Kit Kats. Um, trauma, we see uh, hit by cars, uh, dog fights, cat fights. We do get a lot of those. Depending on how many puncture wounds, how bad it is, you saw that one puncture wound. If you clip it and clean it, you're okay. Cats, animals in general carry a lot of bacteria in their mouth. Cats carry horrible bacteria in their mouth. So when they get into fights and they bite, usually those bites abscess and get pretty ugly. So it's worthwhile getting them on medication from your vet. Um, but if you can clip it and clean it in the meantime, it's a good idea. Dog bites are usually more um, soft tissue damage, bruising, uh, tears, crushing. It hurts a lot. It's, it's worthwhile getting them to the vet. Hit by cars, uh, so we call it, if get hit by a car or any other significant level of trauma, get them to the vet. You don't know what's happening inside. We don't know if we have a ruptured bladder, a punctured lung, internal bleeding. It's good to get them to the vet right away. All right, and so we talked about the medicine cabinet a little bit. Um, we'll go over, I put some dosages. Some of these things are not on this list. I, I use this list more for um, dosages, but the hydrogen peroxide works in dogs, will not work in cats for inducing vomiting. So if poison control tells you to induce vomiting, the sooner you do it, the better. Um, strangely, if you walk the dog around after you give it to them, it will help 
Induce the vomiting. Uh, keep in mind where you got the dog. If they ate chocolate and you're inducing vomiting, you want them outside when they bring this back up again and not on your carpet. Um, the It's hard to induce vomiting in cats. We have products that we use that don't always even work in the clinic. Recently, I was trying to find other options. We had a cat that got into something and I thought it was a joke. I read it online and then I found it several other sources. Was to feed the cat put it on a chair that spins and spin the cap. <laughs> that didn't work either. We tried it, but um, that apparently is a real option for getting a cat to vomit. Um, the Benadryl um, is, uh, works in cats and dogs. Like I said, it's roughly a milligram per pound. I prefer the tablets over capsules and definitely over the liquids. Liquids may have the xylitol in them, which can be toxic. Go back to the hydrogen peroxide. Yep. Uh, How do you get it in? Yeah. Uh, do you have a syringe and you just give it straight or do you dilute it? No, you give it straight. And you always, if you're, if you're, if you have a syringe, um, if you have a, a medicine dropper, um, you can use a spoon, you know. Turkey and baster. Turkey baster. Turkey baster. Yeah. Head to the, yeah. That works. Yeah. And just keep in mind when you're putting it in, give them a chance to swallow it, a little bit swallow, a little bit swallow. Um, don't, you know, drown them while you're doing it. Um, they may foam and slosh and everything, but that's okay. Just give them a chance to get it in. And it, it works quite well, not all the time, but it does work quite well. So, um, in any of these things, trying to get them down, the animals, um, Benadryl, you know, you know, the dogs, you can give it in cheese. Um, people use peanut butter cheese. Uh, I like things that are pasty that you can mold around the uh, pill, like liverwurst or cream cheese, but you can hide it in a piece of hot dog. If your dog's a real pig and eats things quick, you can just wrap it up in a little bit of deli meat um, to get them to take some of these pills. Uh, the Neosporin or Bacitracin or antibiotic ointments, I like to have at home. You can put them on those punctures and cuts a couple times a day. Cortisone cream and cortisone sprays. I like the sprays more for hot spots, things that are moist and oozy, and the creams more for like a rash that's dry. And then uh, the chlorhexidine, I live by chlorhexidine, but I know betadine is still out there. Um, those are good for cleaning the wounds. Definitely dilute them if they're not diluted. If you're up for the challenge of taking a temperature, um, a thermometer and some sort of lube like Vaseline, label that the pet's thermometer from there on out after you do it. Um, but you, you know, you only go in, depending on the size of the animal, maybe half an inch on a small one and an inch on a bigger one. And um, we're looking for a temperature between 100 and 102, 102.5, somewhere in that range. If you're up over 102.5, that's a fever. If you're less than 100, that's a worrisome, especially if your animal's lethargic and not acting right. We call that cooling out, and that means they're in shock or they're fading on you. Um, it's not if you've got bandage material, if you're accident prone and you tend to have bandage material around the house. Um, the best thing, these self-adhesive wraps are great. Um, they you don't need glue or, or anything to hold it together. It sticks. We usually, if you're trying to like cover up a cut until you get them to the vet, um, a little bit of some sort of roll cotton over it, and then the bandage material or material to hold it in place, or um, the medical tape is a good idea. No duct tape. Um, that doesn't breathe, and if it's on for a long time, it can create a really bad dermatitis underneath. I've seen a lot of duct tape, um, but that um, is a good thing to do. When, if you if you were to do any sort of bandaging to your pet, um, keep in mind a tight bandage acts just like a tourniquet. And if it's left on for like 24 hours, the foot's gonna start to swell. It's not gonna get good circulation and it's gonna start to get big. So change it frequently or it's hard, but bandage right from the toe on up. 
And ideally, if it's something that serious, you probably get into your bed anyways. But just keep that in mind. Um, this especially, this type of bandage material is stretchy. So when you pull it out and put it on, it pulls back and it's going to act like a rubber man or a tourniquet and cut off circulation. Um, tails too, if they're if they're biting or chewing a tail. Um, you can get e-collars and cones even at Petco these days. So if you're it's a weekend and you need your dog to stop chewing on a wound that it got, you can get something there um, that can usually help you and get you to the get you to Monday morning. Um, styptic powder, cornstarch, that's for the cut nails. Even people are trimming their dog's nails. If you cut too short, you get a bleeding, which is not the end of the world. Everybody quits doing it. Once that happens, we do it all the time in practice. You, you apologize to them <laughs> because it does hurt. Usually the nerve is right near the vessel. And styptic powder is something you get at pet stores. I think even in men's shaving section, there might be things like that. <laughs> but even cornstarch at home, well, um, you pack that in there and it should help stop the bleeding. Dawn dish soap is important because if your pet does get a chemical on them, and we say Dawn, I'm sure there's other products out there that are just as good, but um, whenever we get a cat that's had a dog sleep product put on, that's the first thing we do. It will cut through the oil and help get the product off. You can even do it two or three times, um, really working on trying to get that chemical to break up and get off of them. Uh, it's a good idea to have the poison control numbers pretty available. There is, I gave you the ASPCA. That's the one we use the most. We like them They're pretty, pretty on the ball, but there are a few others. If they put you on hold a long time, try calling another one. Have your vet's number readily available. And I mentioned the duct tape. I have a good story for that. It might be why I became a vet. Um, our animals never went to the vet growing up. I lived on a small farm. We had cats, dogs, rabbits, chickens, cow or two, a pony, guinea pigs, hamsters, lots of rabbits. I, did a lot and not a single one I think ever went to the vet that I remember my dog traveler broke his leg he was a little beetle and um, mix and my dad repaired it with two paint stirrers and duct tape on his front leg um traveler said no he chewed it off my dad put it on again the next day traveler chewed it off and my dad said the hell with him and his leg healed like that. And we had him probably about another eight years with his leg, like we called him the flitter. <laughs> so I think that had something to do with why I can't. I think I think I'm done. Yeah. So you guys have any questions? Hopefully I told you something you didn't already know or helped you out. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. that's yeah, great. All righty. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>